Hello and welcome to the Equestrian Canada, Canada Equest National Health and Welfare Call. My name is Dr. Bettini Bobstein. I'm the co-chair of the Equestrian Canada Health and Welfare Committee, along with Dr. Wayne Burwash. This call takes place monthly and is open to anyone in the horse industry. The call was developed to increase information sharing within the horse industry in Canada on all topics related to equine health and welfare. Please note that the call is recorded and will be posted on EC's website along with previous calls. Links to the recorded, recorded call can be found in the same location. Because the call is recorded, we will hold questions until the end as some people are not comfortable with their questions being included in the recording. We've muted the background lines, we've muted the lines to avoid background noise. If you wish to unmute to ask a question at the end of the call, please press the unmute icon. We have a very compelling speaker. Dr. Paul will present on the topic of tongue ties and tight nose bands. As some national federations are in the process of revising rules on nose band tightness in horse competitions. Paul McGreevy is a riding instructor, a veterinarian, and an ethologist. Teaching innovation. As Paul is as Paul is from down under in Australia, time change complications required that our speakers will not be able to answer questions in real time. The Health and Welfare Committee members supplied some questions in advance, which we will hear. I hope you find the presentation informative. Hello everyone, my name is Paul McGreevy. I'm a vet at the University of Sydney. I spent most of my working life working with horses and um, I was in practice for five years and then I started to specialize in behavior and welfare. And um, these are my beautiful Frisian cross stock horses. Um, and I'm very lucky to live in a beautiful part of the world called the Hunter Valley. But I do have a, 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 an ongoing appointment at the University of Sydney where I'm the professor of animal behavior and animal welfare science. Most of my work focuses on horses and dogs. Okay, we're gonna look at, at tongue ties and nose bands now. And this is part of a, an ongoing research study that helps us understand how we do things to horses that they might not want us to do, and also how the world sees that sort of intervention. Because increasingly, we are, as horse riders and horse trainers, and horse breeders thinking about something called the social license to operate. I wrote an article, I'll give you a link to this and a number of other links to resources that support this presentation. Um, but in, in um, November 2017, I wrote an article for The Conversation, um, which describes the, the, the growing concerns that people seem to have about the way we race horses. Um, and it, it, it lays out why we, we, as horse riders and horse owners and horse users, we need to be clear about what we're doing to our horses and why, and how we can justify what we're doing to them. And I'm not alone in this. It was um, shortly after that that um, the chief executive of World Horse Welfare, another veterinarian, Roly Overs, um, presented at the FBI and argued that the, the equestrian sport should pursue this social license with the wider community. He de defined this social license as an unwritten, non-legally binding contract where society gives horse sport the right to operate. And he quite rightly argues that it, it's all based on trust. This is a, a process of building trust with society um, trust that the horse sport can operate in an ethical and transparent manner. He also noted how important it is to recognise that we are all responsible for cultivating that licence and he encouraged us to lead that debate. So I'm full of praise for him for, for kicking that, um, that process off. Okay, what I want to do is, is show you some 
information about tongue ties and then we'll go on to nose bands. I think you may see some interesting similarities between the two devices. This is work that's not yet published, but it's been presented at, um, at a conference, at an international um, conference. Um, I will present some unpublished data as well, but this has been presented already. It's work that we did at the University of Adelaide, um, and I'd like to particularly thank Sam Franklin for her help with this study. Tongue ties are very popular in racing. Um, you often will see the, this evidence of a tongue tie here, often fairly neat, um, but in among the other gadgets that we use on racehorses, this is quite common, especially in Australia. The role of tongue ties has been debated since around about 2014. Um, we, we know that they're, they're, they're very common, as I've said, um, the, the reasons for people using them um, are generally to do with increased performance, so getting more air into the horse's airways, and also um, stabilising the tongue. Here's a, a cross-section through the, the horse's head to show you some of the airway issues that you need to be aware of. Horses are what are known as obligate nasal breathers so air is traveling through the nasal cavity um, past the epiglottis and into the into the trachea and this is this is a very neat arrangement um, horses do not have to open their mouth to breathe um, the, 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 the chief thing you need to be aware of is that um, the the epiglottis is critical in this if it does not hold the soft palate in place, then the trailing edge of the soft palate will flap in the breeze and cause noise. And so if a horse makes a noise, a jockey will often say um, that report back to the trainer that the, the horse has done that. And this horse may be then a candidate for a tongue tie. Um, how well that is qualifying as a diagnosis of dorsal displacement of the soft palate, which is the condition we're concerned about, is another matter. So the, classically, dorsal displacement of the soft palate has to be diagnosed with endoscopy on board while the horse is, is working. Um, so very rarely do you get that full diagnosis. So lots of horses are being dubbed as having that condition without a, a definitive veterinary diagnosis. This is what happens in dorsal displacement of the, the soft palate. What we see is um, the soft palate is, is overlying the epiglottis and not allowing that pure function to, to um, proceed. OK, let's focus then on tongue ties. They come in various designs. Um, leather um, is, is commonly used. We also see um, elastic, elastic bands and um, pantyhose or stocking. Um, we've even had reports of people using cable ties, but I'm not sure how true that is. Um, the important thing for, for people in Equestrian Canada to know is that of course these are, these are forbidden by the FEI. We're not quite sure why they were forbidden by the FEI. Um, it could have been to do with the damage done. You, we'll, you'll rarely find um, this in uh, this sort of evidence in a normal horse. This is this is where the ligature of a tongue tie um, has actually produced some permanent damage to the tongue. Um, very rarely you'll see the, the tongue actually missing in former racehorses, which is quite sad to behold. Putting on a tongue tie, if you, if you think about an, an elastic band, for instance, um, there are a number of processes involved. First of all, you have to grab the tongue, put the loop of elastic around it. But of course, horses' tongues are quite slippery and muscular, um, so you, they have to be fairly firmly tight on, on the horse's tongue. So you do a, a, a loop around the tongue um, and then a second loop, and then you bring the tongue forward um, and put a final loop around the, the whole of the, the lower jaw. So this has got two loops around the tongue and then a final loop around the jaw. And then it sits neatly um, beside the bit. 
in your resource pack there is a video of, of that being done with um, a stocking so that link that that uh, Bettina has given you should send you to a, a video of a horse having a tongue tie put on I'm just trying to save time by dodging that um, link what we did for this study was we took a number of harness racing horses standard breads we had 12 of them some had raced some had not and they were in a crossover study so some of them first of all had the tongue tie application TT and then went on to tongue manipulation just to see if that had an effect on its own and others were crossed over so they started with the tongue manipulation and then went on to the um, tongue tie application itself quick look at the design of the study um, tongue manipulation just involved grasping of the tongue to mimic the application of the tongue tie and that was used for just 30 seconds um, in tongue tie application we used the commercially available standard elastic tongue tie um, that's available throughout saddleries in, in Australia and that was looped twice around the tongue as I've set, said and then finally around the mandible or lower jaw okay for each of these treatments that the, the horses were observed for, for 80 minutes first of all with a 30 minute baseline where nothing happened then they had the treatment which as you know was either manipulation or tongue tie application and then finally a recovery period so we were able to watch how they recovered let's have a look at some of the behaviors that were knocked out by tongue ties well if we first of all look at these bars here these are tongue tie applications um, the tongue tie tongue manipulation is white so it doesn't show up on here but the, there's a clear difference between what's going on when the tongue tie is on and when the manipulation alone is given so here we've got two treatments t1 and t2 both of them caused an increase obvious increase in gaping because there was no gaping in these um, manipulated horses a bit of gaping after but it eventually it disappeared okay so that's mouth gaping what about the ears here are the ears um, and what we've got here is an increase in the pointing the ears back as we go from um, the first part of, of the treatment to the second part of the treatment a little bit afterwards but clearly these are evidence of increased ear backwards positioning compared to baseline and so that's telling us that the, the animals are well we think uncomfortable ears back is part of what we're calling what we're now calling pain face or grimace face um, we also saw a fair bit of head shaking in the treatment so again you can hardly see this with tongue manipulation is is minimal there's minimal head shaking when the, the tongue was touched but when the tongue ties were on treatment one and treatment two we could see a, a lot more head shaking than there was in the baseline condition what was really interesting is that we had half the horses had had a tongue tie before in their racing careers and half had not and this is fascinating what we saw was that the horses with prior experience actually showed more head shaking than the naive horses so in contrast to what we normally see with horses where we see habituation this is evidence that they were actually sensitized to the process okay I hope you're getting getting the idea that when when we can barely see something it's because it's barely there um, in the, the manipulated tongues rather than the tied tongues manipulated tied all right what about lip licking well there's virtually no lip licking when you've got a tongue tie on because the tongue can't do any licking but afterwards we saw a lot of lip licking and we call that a post inhibitory rebound so during a period of inhibition where the animal can't show a behavior we might look for evidence of distress heart rates might go up heart rate variability might go down eye temperature might come up um, and cortisol might rise but once that inhibitions disappeared 
we're fascinated to see how the horses recover. What you can see here is that the horses that had their tongues tied showed an increase in lip licking after that period of inhibition. So in behavioral science, that tells us that there was a buildup in the motivation to show that behavior. So we can't say that horses just stopped licking their tongues or licking their lips, I should say, with their tongues because they didn't feel like it. There was actually a buildup. If you compare this amount of lip licking with what was seen in the baseline. So this is in very important information. Studying animals after a period of deprivation tells us a lot about what they were missing. Okay, let's move on to salivary cortisol. So that's taking a saliva sample and looking for the so-called stress hormone cortisol. Um, and what we can see in this part of the, the study was that in the horses with manipulated with tongue ties on, we saw a rise in saliva cortisol. It takes a while to show, um, but it's clear that these animals had a, st a physiological stress response um, in response to having their tongues tied. So that's due to be published in an online journal shortly, but you've, you can see why we're concerned about um, tongue ties. Um, there's, there's evidence here that, that um, they restrain the horses and cause a stress response. I'm going to show you some unpublished studies from the University of Sydney that, that involve a survey of um, racehorse trainers. Um, and just, just a very brief overview of what, what we can tell you so far is that um, dependent on the sport, thoroughbred racing is more likely to use stockings. Um, these are problematic because they do get very thin, very narrow when they're tightened. So they can actually begin to cut into the tongue. So fortunately, the, um, the rules of racing are, are, are going to try and address this by um, helping ensure that the, the width of, of the tongue ties is standard and doesn't cut into the, the tongue too much. The, the, um, the standard bred trainers, the harness racing people seem to prefer elastic tongue ties. Um, they, they're the ones we can use in the studies because they're, they're a standard size, so we can apply them in a standardized way. We can't standardize the use of stockings. The good news here is that nobody is telling us they're using cable ties. What we did find was that half the respondents in this survey told us that they'd seen either a physical or a behavioral complication due to tongue tie use. And the interesting thing for us is that those reports increased if people told us they kept the tongue ties on for longer. Now that could be because the horses are getting a reduced blood flow to the tip of the tongue. And that may be why some of the horses unfortunately even end up losing the tongue completely. Um, some of you may be aware of how to study blood flow in anatomical specimens. Um, we call that a corrosion cast. And we've got some early studies of how the, the tongue uh, vascular system responds to tongue ties. I'll just show you a, a, cor a corrosion cast that some of you may well be familiar with. It's of a, it's of the vascular um, system in a kidney. So what you do is you inject the, the blood vessels in a kidney or any tissue with latex and then you dissolve the tissues around with a corrosion agent. Um, so this is what a kidney looks like. Um, this is showing you the blood vessels through the kidney. Um, this is an image of a tongue that's half corroded and this is the artery fl flowing through the tongue until you reach the area where we put a tongue tie on and you can see that the flow is badly compromised here. We may get some pooling of blood here but this is what we're worried about is, th is the lack of flow that operates when a standardized elastic tongue tie is put in place. Okay, um, and that may explain why we see some fairly muddy, poorly perfused tongues. So that's a quite a, a, an unpleasant look. Um, if a veterinarian saw a, a horse with that colour tongue in a stable, they'd be very alarmed. So this horse um, is is probably 
suffering from a lack of blood flow to the, the tip of the tongue. I should mention that the other reason that, that we're told that, that trainers like to put tongues, tongue ties on is to avoid the tongue getting over the bit. Um, whether that is, is, is a big deal or not, we're not sure. We, we'd like to consider that further. Um, but you can see that this horse has certainly got a, a worrying look of um, lack of perfusion, lack of blood flow in the tongue. There are all sorts of reasons why this photo is alarming for, for other reasons, I know that. Um, so, the interesting development since we started exploring tongue ties is that they've actually been banned um, in Germany. So in, in racing, in, in gallop, galloping racing, that's to say not trots, not pacing, but the, the gallopers in, in um, Germany, now we, we're seeing the abandonment of tongue ties. Um, and in South Africa, the NSPCA is pursuing uh, criminal charges over the practice of tongue tying. So we can see here that, that racing is, is under some scrutiny because of this practice. It stops normal behavior, it may compromise blood flow, and it's associated with a, a stress response. Okay. Now let's look at, at nose bands. Um, we're, we're assured by the FEI that the welfare of horses is paramount, which is very pleasing. Um, I'm part of the International Society for Equitation Science, which involves a number of coaches and um, veterinarians. Um, and the, the society has um, had a position on nosebands since 2012. Um, you can find that position at this address equitationscience.com and of course you're all welcome to join the, the society and um, we do have a, 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 a the way we conduct our studies often seems to have a focus on dressage um, just because we, we're interested in concepts such as as self-carriage and what the horse is capable of doing and we're, we're fascinated by the way the sport is is changing over time if one compares um, Alaric with, with Totalas, you can see a, a very different sort of um, frame and way of going. And this is fascinating because we're able now to look at studies over time. Um, a group in, um, in the States had compared head and neck positions of elite horses um, in dressage at, uh, in 1992 and 2008. Um, and what they found was that um, if you look at the, the head angle, if you compare the Grand Prix tests at the Olympic Games in 92 and the, the Grand Prix test in the World Cup in 2008, um, these data are really fascinating because they focus on collected canter, collected trot, passage and piaf. And they were particularly interested in looking at um, the angle of the head in other words, the flexion at the pole. Um, and BHV is behind the vertical. So this study um, found that the likelihood of horses being behind the vert vertical um, during um, passage or PF was significantly greater in 2008 than, two than 1992. Um, and that higher scores were correlated with um, he head positions um, further behind the, the vertical in PF in 2008. So if, we, if we're if we told we shouldn't ride behind the vertical, we would expect the scores to reflect that, but they don't. Um, in 1992, we saw head angles behind the vertical um, only for collected trot and collected canter. Whereas um, in 2008, um, they were, we saw behind the vertical in all paces. So things have changed, whether they've changed for the better is, is arguable. Um, if we're talking about what happens when we 
apply pressure to the the bit and get the horse to, to flex we are we have to accept that we're using pressure um, on the the tongue and the bars of the mouth um, and many horses will open their mouths in response to that we know that and that's why when we're using fairly strong tensions a lot of sports will be aware of, of the effect of, of, of the bit on mouth opening. We know from the grimace scales that I've mentioned already um, that the tongue out um, and the mouth open are now being recognised as signs of pain. And we know that there's some pretty awful things that can happen um, inside a horse's mouth. Um, these are images courtesy of um, a Swedish uh, dentist he's actually a human dentist but he now works mainly with animals um, Torbjorn is, is a is an extremely good practitioner but he's gone to the effort of looking at where the bits lie relative to the teeth so these are rather wonderful images of his Icelandic horse with superimposed images of um, the teeth you can see the the inside the canines there the incisors here the tongue here with this characteristic dip which is often where the the, the, the bit sits let's see what happens when we put a bit in the horse's mouth and apply pressure this is what we don't see but this is thanks to Torbjorn we've got these amazing images um, that's where the, the single bit is sitting um, with a double bridle um, we've got more furniture to accommodate and we're, so we're seeing more um, space occupied by bits inside the mouth and more dipping into the tongue just because of the, the volume of the bits. That's important because when we put a tongue a nose band on uh, we, we've got more, more, more apparatus inside the horse's mouth with a double bridle and less space for them to be accommodated. When we put a bit into a horse's mouth, um, we know that in the best of all worlds, it'll just sit there passively um, on the, the tongue and the bars of the mouth. Um, if the horse decides to um, cushion its bit, it will f pull the tongue back and, and cushion itself against bit pressure um, by pulling the tongue back into a sort of ball. And to do that, it has to open its mouth. So uh, an open mouth is likely to be a comfort behavior. Um, and if the horse is wearing a, a, a loose nose band, then the horse, the, then it can achieve that. You can see that the tongue's being balled up here. Another prospect is that the horse can actually seize the tongue between the, the molars or the premolars. And, and again, that will be a resistance, but the, the, the horse has to open its mouth to achieve that. So whether the tongue's bald or flat, open mouth is an attempt by the horse to, to, to increase its comfort. These are images derived from um, studies of uh, horses being radiographed um, by Hilary Clayton, a, a rather wonderful colleague at Michigan. Let's look at what happens inside the horse's mouth. This is a section of the horse's head. Um, here's the tongue, a rather massive organ. Um, let's see what happens when we put a bit in the horse's mouth. Um, you can see that the tongue is the most likely area to be compressed. And um, that's because when God made the horse he forgot to put some space in for the bit so um, whoops the horse has to accommodate the bit by compressing by allowing its tongue to be compressed or opening its mouth if you put a nose band around this then there is no option the horse has to expect compression of its tongue and other soft tissues um, that, that um, are lying under the, the nose band so including nerves and veins um, if you put two bits in again you've got you've got more of a problem so that's that's uh, this might seem obvious but it's worth noting okay here's our double bridle um it's a first class lever so what you feel in your hand is probably um something in the order of 10 percent of what the, the horse is feeling so we can we have to accept that that what we feel is is, is not really reflective of what the horse is feeling um, especially when we use the levers and 
this is a reasonably tight nose band I think you can probably appreciate that as the horse fights to, to chew and to swallow it will probably be pushing against this tight nose band and that's that would cause skin damage eventually were it not for our reliance on padding so the padding stops those th that sort of um, those pressure sores that would otherwise uh, arise um, and that's why we're seeing padding here and also in the pole this is to protect the horse from the, the otherwise the, the likelihood of, of damage from these devices we're all familiar with the the um, the crank noseband um, we know that our, our latest studies show that these devices are more likely to be used by people who tell us they get complications from noseband use so over tightening with one of these devices is is probably more common than we realize um, and it's associated from what we can see with complications such as uh, damage to the skin uh, we we also know that we we can see a lack of blood flow in some horses with tight tight, tight nose bands um, again like like our tongue tie horse this is probably because of lack of blood flow if we're crushing the the tongue with two bits and then tightening the, the nose band um, the, the, those bits can't be moved around so these, this is the, the sort of consequence that, that or one of the consequences that we worry about paradoxically when you put a tight nose band on a horse it might be more responsive to the reins not for long not because horses habituate to unpleasant things so readily but when you first do that you might find that the horse is actually lighter in the hand and um, we've got some early evidence that that's the case um, in a paper um, we presented in 2011 um, so that suggests that the bits hurt more or are more uncomfortable let's say um, when the nose band is tightened so some people will tighten nose bands before a comp and train in a looser nose band because they know that that responsiveness is not long lived again horses habituate so readily that um, a tight nose band is only going to, to give you more lightness for a brief period before the horse habituates to that new level of discomfort years ago I tell students that this is me years ago and that my bald spot is, is nowhere near as bad as that and this was probably around about the Second World War or, or before um, the students still don't think that's that's impossible um, the little monkeys uh, the, we used to see a lot of noseband checking um, but we, we know that, that that's fallen out of favor um, the former director of dressage um, Trond Asmir noted that the um, that this was an imprecise measurement because of people having different sized fingers um, and as a result that sentence in the rules of dressage has been removed so that the, they used to check with two fingers under the nose band but now they no, no longer do um, the pressures that we are talking about under nose bands as horses um, attempt to chew or, or move the bits around in their mouth um, are quite powerful quite powerful pressures um, a, a fellow called Vincent Casey has studied this in Ireland um, and he looked at with his team looked at the pressure under the nose band with two finger space um, and the pressures range from 200 to 400 millimeters of mercury that's important because um, in human studies pressures over 150 millimeters of mercury are considered dangerous they they there is concern that they can that can be associated with nerve damage so these pressures even with two finger space are concerning simply because the horse is trying to to gain comfort and is moving against a fixed band so in 2012 we did a study um, looking at um, the effect of, of nose bands on eye temperature and skin temperature um, and we used a spacing device that's rather like this this is the ISES taper gauge um, 
and it has been particularly useful in um, a number of, of studies because it's it's been uh, uh, it's allowed us to talk about the, the the space that is under the nose band at this level which is the equivalent of um two fingers in a, a study of, of adults this this study showed that how we measured the the fingers of 20 adults 10 women and 10 10 men um and we developed this device and it has been used in a number of studies um a very good veterinary colleague in Limerick, um, Orla Doherty, led a study that looked at the use of, of nosebands in various equestrian disciplines, and she used the, the, the taper gauge to, to assess tightness. Um, and if we think that um, two fingers is about right for, for noseband tightness, measured in the midline of the horse's head, um, not at the side, but in the midline, in front of the horse's nose. What, what she found, what Orla found was quite alarming, that less than 7% 7, 7 of horses had um, two finger space. 44% um, had no space at all. So the, the, the taper gauge could not be put under the nose band at all. That's one finger, that's two fingers, but 44%, slightly over 44%, could not accommodate even the tip of the device. Now that's 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 a worry. These these were mainly um, eventers and dressage horses, um, but that paper you can download that paper. I'll put that on the list of resources for Bettina to share. Okay, when you tighten the nose band, you don't just stop the the jaws moving. You actually push the nose band against the teeth. So that's obviously of concern if the if we end up with ulcers. So being aware of what's going on inside the horse's mouth is critical. We also worry about the prospect of new bone forming. Um, so we can get dips and bumps at the site of, of nose bands, especially in older dressage horses. And there's some evidence of um, radiological changes in these animals. I'll come back to that in a moment. All right, so if we think that we can check the nose band with this sort of standardized device, um, more and more vets are appreciating that this could be worth doing, not least because if you're pushing the cheek against the teeth, you're probably going to have to ask your vet to do more tooth rasping. If the nose band was looser, then maybe it, the horse could have its regular dentition without the risk of um, those sorts of ulcers. And perhaps the the dependence on rasping would, would decline a little. Who knows? That, that's another study. Um, we've been talking about this in veterinary circles for some time. Um, this is a paper from um, 2015. It foreshadowed a study that was published in 2016. I'm going to show you that now. What you need to know is that this was a study with 12 horses that were naive to nosebands. We were particularly keen to find horses that had not habituated to nosebands. In contrast to the tongue tie study, it's not dissimilar, but what we did was 10 minutes baseline, 10 minutes treatment, 10 minutes recovery. And we didn't do a manipulation um, treatment, so it's just 10 minutes with a nose band at different levels of tightness. So there were four different levels and you'll see these colors on the graphs. So blue is unfastened. Red is the conventional area under the nose band, two fingers. Green is half that, so one finger, half the conventional area under the nose band. And finally, purple is the one you need to watch for. That's no area under the nose band. And I'm gonna share with you some data on eye temperatures, heart rate, heart rate variability and behaviors. Let's start with behavior. What you can see here is that this is the baseline, a certain amount of, of, of licking. Um, when you put the nose band on, you get a dose dependent reduction in licking. So you'll get, you can see here that there's still a bit of licking going on in the, the um, unfastened nose band, um, but in the tongue, the nose band with no area underneath it, the, 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 the very tight version, um, 
will will eliminate licking completely, which may suit some people. Afterwards, we're seeing a rebound. We're seeing an, an increase in those behaviours after a period of denial. That's that post-inhibitory rebound that I talked about. Here's chewing, and again, we can see a dose-dependent um, elimination of the behaviour. We can't get rid of chewing completely, so it wasn't the tightest noseband in the world, um, but we do see an increase in those behaviours after a period of deprivation, but perhaps not more than we saw before. So you wouldn't call this a post-inhibitory rebound, but you would call this an, a post-inhibitory rebound. This is an increase in swallowing. So here we've we've got low levels of swallowing and then a, 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 an almighty return, and it's higher than the the, the baseline level so that suggests that the horses were missing the opportunity to swallow who knows that may be why some horses show a wet mouth um, in, a, in a, a dressage test um, that that is a fascinating prospect we need to look in that, into that closer um, and we also looked at heart rate as I said and um, this is a standout as you can see that was a significant difference the heart rates increased in the horses with the tightest nose bands. Heart rate variability is an interesting one. That's the next one I'm going to show. L low heart rate variability suggests distress. So again, our purple line shows that, that the tight nose bands were associated with the, 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 a radical shift in heart rate variability. Oh, and that was significant, yeah. Finally, we, we looked at the eye temperature. Eye temperature is a fascinating way of gathering data about an animal's stress levels because we tend to find that, that eye temperatures increase when an animal's um, distressed. The beauty of this is we don't have to take saliva samples, we don't have to take blood samples, we can t measure the, the response with a non-invasive approach because the last thing we want to do when we're looking for stress is distress the animal. Um, clearly so eye temperature peaked in um, the treated horses with the high the, the tightest nose bands um, that was a significant difference there all right what we can conclude from this study is that tightening nose bands um, for, for 10 minutes in these naive horses wearing a double bridle um, limits licking chewing and swallowing and we see a dose related physiological stress response that's linked to the inhibition of these oral behaviors but we can't be sure whether that stress response comes directly from the pressure of, of the devices or um, being deprived of the behavior or both so that's another study yet another study to, to think about um, what we concluded was that using relentless pressure to eliminate oral behaviours in pursuit of a competitive advantage may be difficult to justify um, ethically. So that paper is online and again I'm going to give Bettina um, the link so Bettina is going to give you, hopefully has already given you the links to this study. This paper has been viewed over 50,000 times online. Um, there is a critique in the comment section and a response to the critique. So if you're really interested in this, be assured that we have spent some time um, engaging with some of the, the leading dressage riders in Europe to um, explain why we did what we did and, and what we think we found. So that's in the comment section online. Um, as I've said, if you're interested in this sort of um, discussion, then I commend you to um, the International Society for Equitation Science. Its website recommends that nose band sh should be checked <clears throat> in the nasal midline, so not at the side of the, the face. You're not going to find out much information. You could drive a bus under there and still have a tight nose band. But um, it also talks about the merits of, of uh, using a standard gauge. And we know that um, this, the, the benefit of doing this could restore traditional practice, allow the best riders to shine. It would be good for, for dressage and, and eventing. It would certainly be good for horses. And we'd see less of this sort of ugliness. Since that paper was published, there's been a follow-up looking at horses in Europe. And um, this was 
conducted by Hillary Clayton again, I mentioned her from Michigan, um, with the chief vet from um, the Danish Equestrian Federation, Meta Udal. What they found was that um, <clears throat> when they looked at over 3,000 horse rider combinations competing in dressage, show jumping, eventing and endurance, they found that oral lesions and blood was visible at the commissures, the corners of the mouth, the commissures of the lips in 9% um, in of horses and increased with the level of competition. Um, and they found that tighter nose bands increased the risk of oral lesions. Since that paper came out, we've been doing some studies in Mexico um, with the cavalry horses there, um, a wonderful team of um, vets and volunteers, uh, volunteer veterinary students have been helping with a study there. This hasn't been published yet, but what they've been looking at is um, bumps on noses. This is a big one, as you can see, um, and, and trying to establish using radiography what those bumps actually mean. So we've got a series of, of these horses. Um, they're actually over 140 that we're going to, to talk about in a, an upcoming paper. So I'll be able to describe where we think we might see a dip and where we might see a, a, an, an increase in exostosis or a bump. And clearly we need a large number of horses to get this sort of information um, across. Um, here's another one, slightly worse. Um, and a bit parrot mouth i think look at that that's quite extraordinary anyway um that that these studies will also involve um a visual appraisal and um noting where there is evidence of white hairs on the on the the, the nose we'll also look at the mandible um because if pressure is causing any changes here this can see where the nose band's been lying we also need to look at the the mandible um for changes there too um, s since the, um, the Danish study, the Danish Equestrian Federation have set a limit to noseband tightness um, and it's not quite two fingers but it's, it's, it's probably um, a, providing a, a step in the right direction for those horses um, and also we've seen something similar, um, I think it's one finger in, in um, New Zealand. So this really fits into the question of what we do to horses and whether we can justify what we're doing. Um, if we can ride them without tight nosebands then maybe we should. If they're opening their mouths because they're uncomfortable then that's information that many of us would want the horses to share with us. Um, and it feeds in, for me, it feeds into this discussion, this growing discussion about the, the social license to operate. Um, I, I, I go, going back to what Rowley Over said, um, it, it is important that we recognise that we're all responsible for cultivating that licence. Um, and I hope that that we can continue to have this, this discussion because on a very small level, we could think about the social licence to use tongue ties or the social licence to use restrictive nosebands. Perhaps that's what we need to do as a next step. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for this opportunity um, and I look forward to contacting you um, with your feedback. Um, and uh, once again, it's been a great pleasure to be able to, to present this, this information to you. And there's plenty more to come, so watch this space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McGreevy, for this fascinating overview of this, of this issue. I'd like to share some of the questions now that were submitted in advance by the Health and Welfare Committee. Uh, question number one, do you feel there have been improvements in the monitoring of nosebands since this was identified as a hot topic in 2017? Paul replies, it feels as though there has been some progress in forward-thinking countries where equestrian federations can see the need to give horses a voice but it appears that most organizations will not, not act on any ethical issues observers may have with denying horses the opportunity to yawn, lick, chew, and swallow. They instead demand evidence that the horse plays a physical cost for wearing a restrictive noseband and evidence that horses do not simply learn to tolerate the practice. It saddens me that demanding these pieces of evidence fundamentally erodes our social license to operate 
who impose this mechanical restriction and even questions our having a voice in how we treat our horses because we're so conflicted by our own interests. After all, it takes a long time to retrain horses that have competed with a restricted noseband. The evidence of damage done will emerge, but as their own worst enemies, horses will always habituate to aversive practices and make abuse appear okay. Quote, just because you can do something to a horse does not make it okay, unquote. Question, since tongue ties are prohibited in competitions, does racing also look at banning them? Response, Racing Australia has banned the use of elastic stockings as tongue ties and Germany has banned tongue ties completely in racing. Question, do you agree that the FEI should be leading the file on rules regarding noseband tightness, considering that many national federations follow these rules? Response, yes, but, it's, but because FEI no longer has a welfare subcommittee, there is therefore, unsurprisingly, minimal leadership on welfare. Question, after being presented with information and evidence, how receptive are horse owners, trainers, and riders to monitoring and regulation of noseband tightness? Response, the latest paper on noseband practices that was Weller et al. 220, which we will provide a link to, shows only minimal awareness of the taper gauge gauge check, but is encouraging feedback on where noseband tightness is concerned. And I think what that means is I think horse owners are very interested in this. Question, has anyone looked at the placement of nosebands on the face? There seems to be a trend to adjust them very high on the nose, sometimes as high as the cheekbones. Yes, is in response. Orla Doherty reported this in her international survey paper which is also going to be on the website. At this point, um, I'd like to ask if there's any further questions from our listeners, um, either to Equestrian uh, Canada, or that you would like passed on to Dr. McGreevy, uh, and we will uh, uh, get those questions answered for you. Um, if you wish to ask a question, you need to unmute your microphone eye icon uh, on your screen. Any questions? It's Mary Bell. I had the sense from the talk that um, there are no noseband regulations currently. I don't believe that is true. I think there are, both in FEI and in EC. Uh, the measurement is not done in the bridge of the nose, but the measurement, I do not believe, has been removed. It's uh, from looking at the rules, and I don't have them in, in front of me, Mary, and prob probably should have, apologies for that. It's a little bit of a patchwork between, <laughs> between the, 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 uh, the, the, the jumpers, uh, the, the hunter jumpers, the eventing people, and the dressage crowd. There's no consistency between them. Thank you. Any other questions? Certainly those, those regulations are available uh, on, the, on the Equestrian Canada website, so you can definitely look up the regulations for yourself um, for all the disciplines that use nose bands. Any further questions? If you, uh, in, in hindsight, if you would like me to put any questions directly to Dr. McGreevy, by all means, uh, email uh, Christy House at Equestrian Canada, and I can make sure that we get you a custom answer to your question. Um, if there are no more questions from our large audience today, which I really appreciate, um, I just like to thank Dr. McGreevy for doing this presentation for us. I'd like to thank Christy House and the Equestrian Canada communications team for putting this together. I know that you've been uh, very challenged with all of the COVID things going on and, and I really appreciate that you're, you've taken the time for this. Um, we hope to see you all out again for the next EC Health and Welfare call. If you know others that might be interested in this presentation, it can be accessed and the other recordings uh, through the Equestrian Canada website. Thank you all again for taking time out of your day and uh, we uh, appreciate uh, your participation. Thanks, Bettina.